the next reading from your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles with you, it's from Acts. It's from the book of Acts. The book of Acts was written by Luke, the same person that wrote the Gospel of Luke. And the book of Acts, <clears throat> in some ways you think it should come right after the Gospel of Luke, but it's uh, after, after the Gospel of John. But it's like the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's a way to understand that book. And so at the very beginning, the very first chapter, <clears throat> verses 1 through 11, here's what's going on. I'm going to set this up, the narrative, if you will. Is that after Easter... After Easter, Mary was the only one looking for Jesus, and he found her. He found her. And then Jesus kept showing up, and he kept finding his followers. And so he commissioned them. He commissioned them. He commissioned us. And he, and he called them to go into all the world and to make disciples of all nations. But he said, look, and this is where we pick up the reading. He gathered those 11 together, and he said, here's what needs to happen. Things are about to change. You need to stay here in Jerusalem. Let's pick this story up right here in the, ver- in the verse um, in verse. Um, four. On verse four, on one occasion when Jesus was eating with them, the 11, he said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about, the Holy Spirit. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Understand this, they still were wandering, still thinking about political power. They were still thinking about uh, um, government power. They were still thinking about being in charge, kicking the Romans out. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority, but you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. In some ways, I've always interpreted that as Jesus saying, you know, you're you're worried about this big picture uh, about, you know, political power and so forth. You need to get your heart right first. Does that make sense to everybody? Say say yes. He says, you need to get your heart right, the individual thing. And then, collectively, you're going to do a new big thing, okay? Now, after Jesus said this, verse 9, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they, the eleven, were looking intently into the sky as Jesus was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Here is the rest. That's that next step, right? And one of the ways to understand that is these 11 disciples, one, we're making the transition to be apostles, to be messengers, to be ambassadors, to carry on Jesus' work. The other way to understand it in the theme that we're talking about is they were in new territory. They'd never been there before. They'd never been in that kind of situation before. They'd never been commissioned. They'd never been given this task. They'd never uh, been called to do this. And Jesus bodily just left them. After for 40 days, he showed up um, and found them. And so one of the things to understand from that reading in Acts. It's another example where God is saying, look, look, God is saying through Jesus, I am with you and I'll be with you always. Like in Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. Lo, I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus said, I'll be with you always, but it's also the idea that God is ahead of you. God is ahead of you. Stay here in Jerusalem because God's going to be doing this new thing here, you see. So it's this, this really, really important point that, that we're going to keep focusing on today and over the next couple of weeks, forward and ahead. Faith tells us that no matter what lies ahead, God is already there. God is already there, okay? When we get off the map, God is already there. This map, if you will, these steps, uh, understand that, that we know post-Easter, post-Pentecost, what happened? We know that God was already ahead and already had planned that the Holy Spirit would come powerfully on the day of Pentecost and that the church or the way of Jesus or the the movement of Jesus' people would take on a new form and a new vitality and a new energy and, and, and multiply. And it's this thing, as I said a moment ago, the students of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, they continued to be students of Him with the Holy Spirit, but... They transitioned to apostles. 
They transition to apostles. That is that envoy, that ambassador, messenger, commissioned to carry out the instructions of the commissioning agent. Jesus is the commissioning agent, right? He's the commissioning agent. And so these 11, and then they, 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 they elected a 12th one, and then their numbers kept growing. They became apostles to the ways of Jesus and to the way to right relationship with God through Jesus. But again, I'm going to go back to this point that this was new. It was, for them, uncharted territory. For them, it was a whole new thing. I mean, for three years, everything had kind of been new, but Jesus was right there with them. He was with them, and he found them after, after Good Friday and after Easter. So the first apostles now, they are in a new place in their life, and they could choose what to do. They could deny it. They could say no. They could try and go back doing what they were doing before, or they could just kind of hang out in Jerusalem and not be open and receptive, or they could go forward. And of course, they chose to go forward. They chose to go forward every day in what they did, their tasks, their work, their faith. They were beat up. They were, they were thrown in prison. They were crucified upside down. These first apostles still went forward because God was with them and God was ahead of them. They were traveling with a new map as a way to think about it. And God was with them and God was ahead of them. And here we are, church, because of them. And it's just framing that that from Acts and understanding it. Here we are because of their faithfulness and because of their willingness to trust God and to allow God to use them and work through them. Here we are, church, a couple thousand years later because they were They were willing. And so today and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be examining this about um, uh, our faithfulness and about our willingness to trust God both on the map and off the map, to trust God not just for ourselves, but for those who will come after us, for those who will come after this. Here's the thing. God's people are still being called and still being formed to reclaim the role of apostles. And, 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 And this is something you need to hear. Is that is it, this is a new thing. This is a new thing. I hope a new way to understand this. Is that, is that we, are, we are church in a place we've never been before. The church. The church in North America especially. The church. Whether it's Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever. The Protestant movement as well as I think Catholicism. We are in a place we've never been before. We are off the map. We are off the map. The world has changed dramatically. It has. We're off the map. And so we need to figure this out because the maps that we've used for many years of how to be the church and how to do church and, 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 and all that, those aren't relevant anymore, those maps. They're not working. Obviously, last week I talked about nuns and duns, right? About the nuns, the people that claim no religious affiliation, the people that say, well, I'm spiritual, but I don't want to be religious. Or the duns, the people that say, I'm done with organized religion. I'm done with going through the motions. I'm done with going and being part of some, a group of people that fights all the time. I'm done. And so we're in a place we've never been before. And I mean that. It's not an exaggeration. We're off the map. But yet God still calls us calls you, not just other people, not just uh, uh, perfect people, not just uh, whatever people. God still calls you individually and calls us as a body to be apostles. And, and if you've been sitting here in these blue chairs for a number of weeks or months or whatever, you've heard this. You may not remember, and I get got to have repetition, but it's this idea that if we don't take Jesus into the world, who's going to? So we're called to be apostles, and that's a big thing, and that's a serious thing. That's a wonderful thing, and that's why This is such an important point, is that we're being called to go ahead. We're being called to go forward, and we have to do that, and we can only do that knowing that God is with us right now and that God is ahead of us and is figuring out where God wants us to be. Our task, our work is to be attentive to that right now, um, to be the church, to be Jesus' students, and to be apostles. And as I said, we're off the map. We're off the map here in North American Christianity. It's different. The world has changed. And, and, and again, we have choices. We can either try to go back. When I say that the maps aren't working the way that um, we did church, the way that we were the church, the way that we understood ourselves as Christians in 1965 or 1985 or in 2005, it isn't necessarily working anymore. It's not. And that's where, again, the statistics of nuns and duns and casual Christianity and cultural Christianity, where people just say, I'm Christian, I guess, because I'm not Muslim. 
and I'm not Hindu, and I'm not, right, fill in the blank. So I guess I must be a Christian. That's cultural Christianity. We've never been at this place before in our culture, in our world, where that is so pervasive. And the maps that we used to use, they won't really work anymore. So we can either try to go back. We can either try to go back and, and, and live in the good old days, right? We can either try to go back and be the, try to be the church and do church uh, and use the language of church that worked, as I said, in 2005 or 1985, but it's not working. And the other choice we have is we can just kind of hunker down in place, church. We can just kind of hunker down in place or as individuals, this is the same choices, and just hope something magical happens, hoping something, anything, maybe something will change. I don't know. Maybe Jesus will come back today and we won't have to worry about it. I don't know, right? Or our choice is to go forward. And I would say, of course, that's my choice for myself and for us, is that if we want to thrive, if we want to grow, if we want to live abundantly as individuals and as a Christian community, it's about going forward. It's about going forward and submitting to the map maker, and that's God. It's about going forward and not just being attentive and being tuned in uh, to God and God's plan and God's purpose and God's desire. It's being attentive to the signs and to the guides. Guides, guides. I call guides are those people that God works through because God has always worked through people um, to, to, to direct us and to lead us and to show us and to correct us and to change our thinking. It's about being attentive to the signs and the guides, especially while we're off the map so that we can move forward. That is our task before us. And here's the powerful image that I'm going to use, that I want to use today and over the next couple of weeks. Next week, I'm going to talk about this. And then on uh, May 19th, our bishop, Bishop Lori Howler, will be here. And I've invited her uh, to bring a message uh, on this about being off the map. And it comes from this book. It comes from this book that, that, that I read, and I know the bishop read it, and a bunch of people read it. And um, it, there it is up on the screen. It's by uh, Pastor Todd Bullsinger, Canoeing the Mountains, Christian Leadership in Uncharted Territory. And so the image that he uses, and it's absolutely influenced my thinking. It absolutely influenced my thinking and my speaking and my writing um, and, and uh, uh, today and, and going forward. And part of it is because, because I'm a student of history and I love the story of Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery. How many of you, be honest, how many of you know a little bit about this? Lewis, Clark, Corps of Discovery. Okay, cool. You know, I, I, I love it. And so when I picked up that book, um, I was reminded that several years ago, I read Stephen Ambrose. Uh, historical book about Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery. And then I took a big motorcycle trip out west and I followed as much as Lu of Lewis and Clark's trail as I could, right? So like in Mobridge, South Dakota, you pick up the trail there that goes up the Missouri River into North Dakota and on up into Montana and then, you know, the Lolo Pass, um, you know, uh, down into uh, uh, ends in, uh, uh, there are two towns across the Snake River from each other. One's in Idaho, one's in Washington, one's Lewiston, one's Clarkston. That's pretty cool creative names, right? Oh, Lewis Clark. Anyway, here's the powerful image. It's a powerful image um, from Lewis and Clark. There's Lewis and Clark in Sacagawea. That's a mural that hangs in the House of Representatives in Montana um, up there. Um, they, they owe a lot to those guys. Here's the deal, is that there's an image here. There's a, there's a, a metaphor. There's a, there's a powerful example of how we go forward. And it comes from this, this history. And, and, and the quick history is this. In 1803, now I know some of you don't like history, but don't, don't tune out, hang in, you learn something. 1803, we were living in Louisiana. Pretty cool, huh? I lived in Louisiana. I love living in Louisiana. I love crawfish boils and shrimp and all that stuff. Um, we don't have that so much here. But once upon a time, we were all Louisiana, and you can see the area in kind of yellowish tan. And then Napoleon Bonaparte needed money to fight wars, and so he sold, Napoleon sold all of this land to President Thomas Jefferson in 1803 for like $33, 35000000 million, something like that. And President Jefferson looked at all this land, and even though there had been different explorers through there in the previous 300 years, I mean, that includes Dubuque, right? We have the Five Flags uh, Center. Why? Because we've been owned by all these different countries here in Dubuque, Iowa. But Thomas Jefferson looked at this and said, this area needs explored. It needs mapped. It needs mapped. We need to know what we got. We need to know the people out there. We need to know the animals and the, the plants. And we need to know the land features. But most of all, most of all, what President 
Thomas Jefferson, when he called Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, called them into the office, I guess, the White House office, said, put together a team because we need to find the great water route. We need to find the great water route that goes from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. Because we need it for commerce. We need it to open the country up. At that time, boats was a a major way of moving stuff, trading, making money, and all this stuff. And so, Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery took off. They took off from Washington, D.C., between 1804 to 1806. Took a couple years, 33 volunteers. And they went and they explored. Now, understand that they they were river guys, right? So if you look at this map, and I know it's kind of small, but so they, they, they got to St. Louis, you know, did some of the Mississippi. They jumped on the Missouri, and they started paddling upstream. They started paddling and keelboating against the current. And, and they were confident to this. They kind of had some sketchy maps, and they had word from French explorers and some Spanish folks that had gone up there looking for this water route. They kind of had an idea of what the world would look like up there, and they followed the Missouri River, and uh, again, they had canoes, and they had flatboats, and they got to what we now know as um, like Great Falls, Montana, and they got there, and it looked like, like this is the headwaters. This is where the Missouri River starts, and, and, and there's a long hill up here, and you know what, guys? Here's the deal. I can imagine them saying, Lewis and Clark saying to the Corps of Discovery, okay, here's the deal, boys. We're going to carry our boats up over that hill. We're going to get them up there because what we're going to find is a big river that's flowing down to the Pacific Ocean, and the hardest part of our journey is over. Man, we're on easy street now. We're going to get up to the top of this hill, and ah, we're, going to, we're going to just float all the way to the Pacific Ocean, and yay, uh, go fight win. We won. We did our journey, right? What happened is they got to this point in Great Falls, and according to the journals and so forth, uh, Meriwether uh, uh, Lewis got to the peak of this hill first, expecting, expecting to see this river And instead, he saw endless mountain peaks, endless, endless mountain peaks. And if you've ever been up in that part of Montana and and looking through Montana and obviously on into Idaho, that's what it is. It's the Rocky Mountains. It's it's the Bitterroots. It's it's the Rocky Mountains. It's that part of the Rocky Mountain, uh, Mountain Range that it was totally unlike totally unlike anything Lewis and Clark had seen because they were used to the, 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 the mountains and the Appalachians, kind of uh, rounded tops and trees. They got to the top of the hill and everything changed. Everything changed. And they had choices to make because everything that they had conceived in their mind of how it was going to be, right? The map that they had been following, both literal maps and a mental map of what they were going to find and how it was going to go and how the most difficult part of the journey was over, that all crashed and burned standing on top of that hill. In other words, life just wasn't what they thought it was going to be, and they had three choices, didn't they? They had three choices. And their choices were, and I put that little blue line, that's approximately where they were, right? <clears throat> they thought the Columbia River was on the other side, and it wasn't. The Columbia is clear over there in Washington and Idaho. So one choice, they could go back to Washington. They knew the way. Fair? Go back the way they came. Go back down the Missouri, hit the Mississippi, go back across, go back to Washington, say, President Jefferson, sorry, we struck out. That was one choice. We can go back to, they could have just hung out there um, with the Indians, done whatever, too embarrassed or whatever, hope that something magically would change. Maybe somebody would come along and say, oh, the river you're looking for is over there. Oh, okay. No, they didn't do that. They did what? They exchanged their boats for horses, and they went ahead. They went forward. They went forward. And so they made it. They made it to the Pacific. They made it. And, and again, I, I, I know some of that route. I know what's now called the Lolo Pass, if you ever get a chance to ride it. Aaron, are you still in here? You rode the Lolo Pass after I rode it, okay? Montana down to Idaho. It's one of the best, coolest roots in the, in the world, you know. Um, they made it, but they wouldn't have made it. They wouldn't have made it if they would have just stuck with what they knew. They wouldn't have made it if they would have just stayed with their old map. They wouldn't have made it. Now, let's switch to us, okay? Let's switch to us, our individual 
real lives. It's this idea of in our lives, we follow maps, either literal maps or mental maps. We follow maps. Maybe it's a career map, for example, like here's a path to take, you know, to, to you know, start down so you'll be happy, you know, um, life map, work hard, be a good citizen, be a good person, and life will mostly be uh, happy and satisfactory. That's like a mental map that we may have of how to live lives. Or maybe we have a religious map, right? Um, we, we were in the desert of, dis, uh, of, of discipline, then we made it to the forest of, of focus and the hills of courage and the mountains of happiness. We had to go through the candy cane forest. No, that's another movie. Anyway, no, we follow like religious maps even. I think we have these mental religious maps that we, like we're given. Like, okay, you're baptized and you go to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and the church imparts knowledge to you and gives you your religious uh, bones, right? And then, you know, you join the church and then, you know, when you go to college or leave home, you quit going to church and then at a certain time you, you come back and you attend worship at Christmas and Easter and you do those things with mom and dad make you go. And, and then, you know, you, you get going in your life and then maybe you have your first child or whatever and say, you know what, maybe we need to get that kid back in church so that the preacher and the people can give them their religious bones. And so that's a map we follow. And we show up in church when we can, when we haven't got other choices like ball games or picnics or traveling or shopping or those kinds of things. You know, we show up when we can, we give a little bit of money, maybe do a Bible study, maybe serve on a committee. And, you know, that's a map that many people follow. We do this map and God will bless me and, and God will bless my household. And when I die, I'll go right into heaven. I'll go right to heaven. That religious map isn't working anymore, folks. That mental religious map. And I'll say it again, we are off the map. And maps tell us, is my point, maps tell us where we are. Maps tell us where we are, and then we look at it and get an idea of where we are in space and time and say, well, where do I want to be? And, and, and what's the best way to get there? Maps, we get maps. But what do we do what do we do individually? What do you do? When you get to that point, that place off the map, when suddenly it's not like you thought it was going to be, when suddenly you find yourself at a place that you weren't planning on, what do you do? What do you do when you get to that place and say, no, this isn't the script, this isn't the map, right? Let me give you some examples, because I talk to people all the time that are off the map, and sometimes I use that language, and I say, you're in uncharted territory. You're in uncharted territory. And you, we say things like, yeah, yeah, you know, the map is that the parents are supposed to die before the children. That's the map here, right? And when that doesn't happen, we're, we're like, where am I? Uh, re, recalibrating, right? Where am I? Maybe it's sickness, right? Maybe it's sickness or body parts that don't work the way they're supposed to anymore. Hips and knees and elbows or, you know, livers or kidneys, whatever, off the map, either yours or a loved one, or it's cancer, yours or a loved one. I've talked to people about that, you know, even recently, you know, a spouse trying to figure out how to do life, so, you know, I don't know, I want to help, I want to do something, but, you know, they're just suffering. I'm like, yeah, you're off the map. You're in uncharted territory. You didn't plan on being here. You thought there was going to be a river on the other side of the hill, and instead, it's endless mountains. What about divorce? or the death of a loved one, or when you lose your job. See, those are off-the-map times, folks, that I'm talking about, and they're real, and they're real. And most of you sitting here today know what I'm talking about, of getting to that point like Lewis and Clark and saying, I thought it was all going to be different. I was following a different map or something. My map must have failed me. Maybe it's not one of those big things. Maybe it's just waking up every day with this sense of lostness, this sense of a hole in your life. Maybe it's a sense of loneliness or discouragement, or it's this daily, just getting up every day, getting to a point of saying, this isn't fun anymore. This life I'm living, this go through the motions, this work, this career, this whatever, it's not fulfilling, it's not satisfying, it's, there's no joy in this. When these things happen, Again, it's us saying, I've never been here before, and either my map failed me, or I failed myself, or something. And we become unsure, and we say, I've never been here. What do I do? Well, just like Lewis and Clark, and the disciples, and everybody else, there are choices, right? When we hit those points of unmapped, uncharted 
charted territory in our lives, in, in, in our map, our, our mental map, our religious map, our, our career map, our life map, our whatever map that we've been following doesn't work. We can either try to go back, but we know you can never go back, can you? Because the world goes on and we change and people change and circumstances change. But many times we want to uh, do that journey. We want to rock down the highway, but our eyes are in the rearview mirror the whole time. And what happens if you drive down the road and your eyes are in the rearview mirror? You're going to hit the ditch. So you can't go back. You can try. Two, you can just hunker down in neutral. When you're off the map, you can just hope and wait and wish and change. Like maybe something will happen, anything will happen. Maybe somebody will call. Maybe a miracle will happen. Maybe I'll win the lottery. I don't know. I'll just exist and go through the motions. I'll just hunker down here. That's a choice. Or three, it's you know where I'm going. You can decide to go forward and ahead. You can decide and ask for God's help. To go forward and ahead, trusting God, trusting and living, catch this, trusting and living as if God is beside you and that God is already up ahead of you, around the corner, over uh, the hill, and he's got a plan, the master map maker. That's other choice. It is to believe, it is to believe that yes, one, when I find myself off the map, it's in your head saying, yes. I know this psalm by heart, but I'm going to choose to believe it. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It's choosing to believe that, and it's choosing to believe that God is ahead, that God is ahead of you. When you're in those tough times, that God, as Jesus said, he said, I'll be with you wherever you go. As God said, I will not leave you as orphans. I have not brought you this far only to abandon you. It's believing that, that God is ahead, stirring things up, and that there will be signs, and there will be guides. There will be guides along the way, meaning there will be people that God provides in your path to love you and to to, to pray with you and for you. There will be guides, people to give ideas and corrections and directions. It's trusting that God, listen, that God has your best interests. And that's possible through Jesus Christ. Because God wants to be in communion with you, with me, with everybody. So listen, wherever you're at this morning, this hour, on the map, off the map, if you're at a place where you're trying to figure out, I don't know what comes next, I don't know which way to go, my prayer for you has been, and it continues to be right now, may God's Holy Spirit be known and felt by you. God's Holy Spirit, it's a power, it's an energy. May God's Spirit be felt and known by you because you are praying and asking for God's help even in all of this. May the Spirit of God be opening your eyes and your ears and your senses to the presence of God and to the guides and to the signs. May God give you an awareness of God's presence in your life right now, both on or off the map. I invite us to pray about that right now. Lord God, I pray that you make it so. In the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, work in us, work on us, work through us. Lord God, I pray that you bring healing, that you bring help to those that desperately need it right now. I pray that you bring a sense of assurance, a sense of confidence that we can go forward and that we can go ahead and that you are with us and we just need to catch up. We need to catch up to what you're doing, what you're fermenting and what you're bringing about. I pray that you make all this so in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.